The most valuable commodity on earth today is data. How we make it, use it, move it, and protect it. My name's David McCall. Join me today for the QTS Experience. Three, two, one. Dean Bubbly joining Dave McCall on the QTS Experience. Dean, thanks for joining all the way from the UK. From London. Yeah, I'm in central London. Hi, Dave. Uh, it's, uh, it's good to join you. Uh, now, you were telling me just before we went on air that uh, it's a little uh, little warm. Is it warm in London or warm in your yeah, place? Yeah, it's been, it's been a really unusual heat wave here for the last week or so. It's, it's just cooling off a little bit today, yeah. um, but it's been uh, whatever 34 centigrade is in Fahrenheit, which is, I can't remember, it's probably 90 something. So yeah. compared to a lot of the U S South, it's not as, as, as quite as hot and sticky, but for London where nowhere has air conditioning, yeah, it's, it's been pretty brutal. I'm, I'm here in my gorgeous basement. So it's, uh, <laughs> it's quite, you might hear the fan behind me. Uh, yeah. it's all good. I got a fan going as well. Well, um, it's probably in the, in the, 80 something degrees Fahrenheit here in the States, which is a little, you know, 70 is a nice, beautiful, by comparison, <laughs> Honolulu Fahrenheit wise is usually in the low to mid 70s, you know, that nice, pretty breeze. So it's a little bit more humid here. Um, I remember going to visit family in Boston <clears throat> one summer. And uh, on most of those visits, it's no big deal. But we were there one time and they don't have air conditioning there. And it had, it hit 90 degrees. Now, 90 degrees in the South is no big deal when, one, you sort of you grow to it, you acclimate to it. And, two, we have air conditioning for our air conditioning. We have air conditioning everywhere, right? You The only place you don't have it is from the porch to the car. Everywhere else is air conditioning. So we don't really suffer through it. But when you go to places in oh, Europe yeah. – or the West that don't have air conditioning and they get hot, you realize how, remember how miserable it can be. Yeah, particularly oh. with, with humidity. Yeah, no, yeah. I've, I've, I've done that a few times. I travel a lot. Um, I've been to some really weird places. I think, think the record is about 45, 46 Celsius, which is about 112, 114 oh. degrees in the desert in Turkmenistan, oh. which was... Uh, fascinating. It was yeah. just dry, so at least it wasn't too sticky. But yeah. you drink a glass of water, and it would just evaporate straight yeah. out. Yeah. Don't you hate it when they say um, that's a dry heat? You're like, Wait <laughs> a minute. If you, when I was a kid, I went to high school in California, in the Southern California desert, and they used to always tell me, "Dude, it's just a dry heat." And even though I wasn't heavy then, I was big, six two, two hundred and fifteen pounds, and we would walk. We lived just close enough where we had to walk from school to home, or if you had your own vehicle, you could drive. But when I was younger, I walked. And it's a hundred and five degrees outside, and by the time you walk home, dry heat or not, you know you're exhausted. But anyway, thank you for joining me today. We met <clears throat> um, in Hawaii at a thing called the Pacific Telecom Conference. And it was one of my all-time favorite um, uh, panels that I saw. You were up there with a number of other guests, um, tower operators, um, media people, uh, telecom people. And I loved how, um, I think it was Gary Kim who was the moderator, and he posted this really cool kind of premise and you blew it up two seconds and you said well hold on i don't know if i agree with any of that and i just started cracking up um and and um not to put words in gary's mouth or anybody but what what caught my imagination was the conversation among other things was infra telecom infrastructure infrastructure 5g etc and there's a lot of excitement about and there has been for a long time the potential of 5G and, and and this conversation today isn't necessarily exclusively mm. about 5G, but it's just by way of context how we started our conversation. You said, you know how many how many things we have to solve just in the infrastructure world? Um, how you know there's almost this idea, my words, not yours, that oh, you've got a problem. It reminds me of back in the days of blockchain when it was all the rage, the conversation anyway. I've got a problem. Let me just lean it against my AI or my blockchain or my 5G app and 
you know, it's surprise, surprise, it's fixed. You talked about how we're going to solve the challenges of 5G indoor. Or indoor, co- in, indoor connectivity. That's one I always talk about because people don't think about it. But right. there's, there's a lot of others of, you know, whether it's fiber backhaul, just having enough people to do the, some of the use cases and actually understand what you can and can't do. Um, power consumption. Uh, yeah, all of the, the, the sort of, people talking about, I don't know, augmented reality. And I was like, well, you know, your neck's going to be pretty sore if you've got a, a pound of batteries uh, dra- right. dragging your head back. If, you, if you're running some power-hungry radio doing a gigabit a second or something, you know, so you actually maybe you'll have it via Wi-Fi to something local, which might be backhauled with 5G. Right. But all of this is, you know, for any problem you need to think through the solution and people think they're just putting a little 5g dust over stuff suddenly (laughs) turns it into some amazing 21st century ai robotics clairvoyant enabled millisecond latency thing and it's just not true well and now it's going to solve covid so i'm really excited I'm really well, at least, that. mind you, that's, about, that's better than the, the, the problems we had here when they said it was causing COVID. <laughs> and we, had, we had all these crazy people setting fire to uh, telecom masts uh, a few months ago because of, they'd read something on social media and, and everyone was going crazy because of quarantine anyway. So right. they decided to break quarantine to set fire to the very things that were allowing people to communicate from home. Unbelievable. Well, let me ask you this. So what just backing up to the to the beginning of that conversation or this conversation <clears throat> and it's not just 5G you know you 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 expanded the conversation to telecom in general the innovation yeah. that has to happen in telecom and telecom infrastructure et cetera. so if we backed up and and we just start from the sort of i don't know about from the beginning but the start of the conversation which is or maybe we can attack it from two different angles one what are we getting right or where are we innovating or, or what are some things that are really interesting? And then what aren't we getting right? What are problems that are, that are significant problems that we just seem to be whistling past. But as we start this, you're, you're in this conversation every day, helping organizations think through, you know, define a problem, solve the problem. What, what should we be thinking about that we aren't? That's a good question. I mean, so, so where where are we getting stuff right? The, the people who I I meet, who I think are probably the most sort of focused, and that's partly because there's a direct line from the science to the technology to products, is probably on the sort of access network. It's the people doing you know radio stuff. It's the people doing fiber optic stuff. To some extent, they. They're a little bit abstracted from the discussions around business model. They are just trying to think about well, how can we make the next generation of you know, transmission infrastructure that can um, have higher efficiency or we can have multiple antenna elements that we can form into a beam. So I'd say innovation on the well, hardware and the sort of level of software behind that to control it, mm-hmm. that that is continuing a pace and you could argue that it's always continued it's been you know evolving for the last 100 years or so since mm-hmm. marconi mm-hmm. um yeah so so that's there's definitely ongoing innovation i'm finding people talking about ever higher frequencies ever not just higher speeds but sort of doing clever stuff mm-hmm. where i think it falls down is the sort of over, well part two things one is the system orchestration of how do we get all of these bits of the puzzle how do we even identify what bits of the puzzle we need and where the the weakest link in the chain is and and i i think and and how do we identify the weakest link in the chain and how long it's going to take to to fix it um, and I think so. I think often we get the timing wrong about things. Where yeah, and, and everyone knows there's this thing called a Mara's law, which essentially, yeah, whether you call it the hype cycle or anything else, it's things seem uh, inflated in importance in the short term and then underestimated uh, in the longer term. Mm-hmm. Sometimes they're, they're under they're overestimated in the long term, and something just dies and goes away. Mm-hmm. But I think that we're still doing that, and. That and that annoys me. I, 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 I've always wanted to have as my mission in the technology industry as an analyst to to flatten the the Gartner hype cycle because mm-hmm. I see it is massively wasteful and all of the second order problems. I'm like, well, you can see them coming, right? Mm-hmm. It's like that's going to be a stumbling block. 
that's not going to work. And when it all works, you're going to work need to work out how three of them work together, whatever mm-hmm. it is. So I think that's an issue. And the other thing that, that really always impacts telecoms industry is legacy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And 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 legacy fits into a broader category of issues. Um around a, there's, there's an academic thing called a theory called path dependency, which essentially says what happens first impacts you in the longer term because it sticks around, it, it sets mindsets, it sets um, events in train that make it very difficult to, to sort of steer the super tanker. And I see that in the telecoms industry, they've got um, existing infrastructure, which maybe hasn't appreciated. They've got software, which has been grown in yeah, in, in like well, sedimentary stages and then they add on acquisitions. So they sort of integrate, half integrate an acquisition and their systems. Um, the, the, the training programs they have perpetuate the legacy as well, um, possibly the hiring policies. And so then when something new comes along, whether it's a new access mechanism like wireless and 4G and 5G, whether it's a new compute paradigm like cloud and now edge or uh, microservices, it's very difficult for that to get embraced by the traditional telecoms industry. And th- there's also the processes which are built into the, the financial and procurement cycles um, that they have. I mean, I, I, I work as a, an independent analyst, and I mm-hmm. know that for a lot of larger companies, I can find people who want to do business with me and have me in as an advisor or something like that. But I know that I'm going to face two months of procurement hell of actually ha- right. a, a, of how do I get on board their system, even if they want to give me money. And sometimes right. they'll give up and say, you know what, can you bill our law firm? Can you bill our event company? Because that's easier. Right. Um, so, so, so that's not helping the traditional telecoms industry at all. And then what is happening now? Well, th- there's a bunch of what I call, I'll say there's democratization is happening. It is becoming ever easier, despite the theoretical entry barriers, for some new entrance to emerge, if you want to build your own wireless network for your factory or for your airport or for your warehouse, you can now build your own private 4G or 5G network in an increasing part of the world. So at the moment, as we speak, the US FCC is auctioning a bit of spectrum uh, at a, uh, a band called CBRS, Mm-hmm. Um, which allows localized networks to be created. And th- there's a lot of other complexity in there, but, but that essentially means that coupled with cloud-delivered network capabilities, um, a FedEx or a Port of Los Angeles or wherever can build its own wireless network in its own license spectrum without relying on carriers. Um, the same, something similar, slightly different is happening in Germany, UK, Japan, France, Finland, other places. So that's a sort of a form of democratization. You see the same with uh, fiber or fixed wireless as well. Um, you know, data centers, there's obviously um, a, a number of very large data center operators, but there's also a new breed of sort of edge data center options and smaller right. modular providers for perhaps specific use cases. So you end up with this sort of Convergence and consolidation at the top, stimulated by um, a requirement for cost savings. And frankly, it's, it's larger to glue together. Sorry, it's more important to glue together two large companies. But there's also the, sort of a, a huge democratization and Cambrian explosion of new small innovators around them seeing as well. Well, I, and I, I think that's happening. And, <clears throat> you know, certainly it is. Um, uh, highlighted in this industry, in the telecom industry, I see it happening in so many industries. You said something as you were having that conversation, hmm. you were describing that you, you said something once before that I was reminded of during that conversation. And I, I don't know why I wish to goodness I had thought of it. I don't know if you thought of it and you were quote or you were quoting somebody else, but it was this fascinating um, point that engineers love elegance and you know thoughtful design and they will they'll engineer the heck out of something right they build this uh uh you know remove all possibility of failure etc right we highly engineered and that elegance 
Um, and, and But this group's engineering their thing and that group's engineering their thing, et cetera. And you have all these things. And the thing that comes along and makes it all work together is software, you know, the application that you smooth over, sort of spackle over it. Hmm. And I just started chuckling because uh, as a solution engineer and an IT administrator, it's my background. I started thinking about, you know, that's absolutely right. I don't want to release anything until we have tested the heck out of it. But the market is demanding that I move fast or change it. So how do you bring disparate systems and disparate ideas together? You do it through software. So as you were talking about um, the not, not just the innovation, but the opportunity, even if it's not new innovation, it reminds me of um, when the PC, IBM PC first came out. Uh, you know, it was basically off the shelf parts. And very quickly, by the mid to late 80s, a whole bunch of people could jump into the personal computer business yeah. because they could get those parts and assemble it. And they just needed the OS to bring it all together. The, the OS and the BIOS and then someone reverse engineer. I remember reading a book about a company that reverse engineered the BIOS in the original IBM PC. And sure. that was the, the, the main catalyst for that. And it just exploded then. And all of a sudden, instead of, I remember when my dad went to, uh, I was home on leave from the army. He said, come ride with me. We're going over to this place called Computer Land. It's probably hmm. right next to Blockbuster, long since gone. And for $3,600, $4,000, something like that, we got a four color monitor, dual hmm. floppy drive, IBM, XT or AT or whatever it was so fast it left skid marks on the desktop our dot matrix printer that if that thing went off today people would hit the floor thinking it was a drive-by shooting like you know <laughs> cha 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 you know I remember. We, we, it, unbelievable and the game that we played I was home on leave for several weeks two or three weeks he had this game that he loaded Dean and it was just it was all text you know the the wolf enters the room and you knew it was the wolf because it was in red you know and and we had to map everything out <clears throat> but anyway it was a lot of money but once you know three years later four years later it was a third to a fourth of that price for an exponentially better system and I feel like that's where we are in the world of telecom today that so many people are can't wait to solve these problems uh, and, 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 and actually your description just then of the off-the-shelf components, there's a really interesting area at the moment that is going through that potential revolution of going from sort of a monolith to you know, off-the-shelf subcomponents provided by lots of different companies, and that's in the wireless network infrastructure. Mm. And here there's a hefty dose of geopolitics comes in as well. Sure. Because um, once, uh, to some extent, it's in North America, uh, the Chinese vendors didn't really have much of a foothold anywhere, whereas in Europe they do. Mm -hmm. The th thing is, if you then reduce or remove the role of uh, Huawei and Z or ZTE, mm -hmm. you're left for what if you're building a 5G network, there's two big vendors left, which is um, Ericsson and Nokia. Mm -hmm. and, and everyone's now going, yeah, to be honest, we don't really like this idea of a duopoly. So you know, is there a way of doing what you've just described in wireless networks? So you'll hear a lot of discussion about uh, open RAN, open radio, radio networks. Mm. Um, it's still early days, but it's accelerating massively. It was on the cards anyway for the last few years as a way of sort of breaking the, the sort of uh, you know, big vendor lock-in. Um, from the, the, particularly some of the big cellular operators have been very keen on this for a while, like uh, 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 T-Mobile and the, the Korean operator SKT and mm -hmm. Vodafone. Um, but that's been turbocharged in the last um, 12 months. Um, and so there's now this, this desire to sort of, in, in the past, if you built a 3G or 4G network, you've got the, the radio um, which is the, the antennas on the towers, there's the, the box in the shelter uh, called a baseband unit, um, and then you've got the core network. And, and, and a lot of that would come from one vendor, particularly the controller and the, the radio unit at the top of the mast. Mm -hmm. um, and now, open RAN, and there's a, there's a variety of, of sort of mechanisms here of exactly what's open and what interfaces. But the, the long and short of it is, People, oh yeah, the carriers and others want to buy the radio unit from vendor A and the baseband unit from vendor B. And yeah, to have a standardized bit in, uh, interface in the middle. Um, 
you know, I, 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 I'm I my paraphrase, but that's roughly right. what's going on. And so what's happening, and the other thing is they want to take that baseband unit and rather than have that as a lump of metal, they want to have it as standardized servers where someone is running the controller software on it. Um, and so what's happening now is, again, an explosion of software vendors um, uh, that are in that space, you know, sort of probably the best known are Mavenir and Altio Star and Parallel Wireless and a few others, which are now medium-sized companies. Mm-hmm. And then there's going to be a bunch of others who do the radio units as well. And that may well um, does two things. First off, it potentially reduces the costs, which improves the ability to deploy networks in maybe rural areas or in developing markets. But also it means potentially there's a new ecosystem of, I don't know, energy efficient radio units. Someone comes up with a good idea and they can just do the radio unit because they focus, that's what they know on there, an antenna design company or something like that. Um, And they come up with a ultra efficient design or something else or long range or whatever it happens to be. And so now you're going to have this, this sort of explosion of innovators because they don't have to do everything. They can just focus on the bit that they can do and they can maybe differentiate on. That should, over time, and it's not going to be overnight, um, should sort of reinvigorate that part of the the mobile industry. And there's other things that are similar going on in the fixed and fiber side of the, the equipment stack as well. And, and that allows sort of various things. It's, it, it, it means that the hardware guys can focus on the hardware, software guys can focus on the software. Um, and you'll, that'll bring a whole bunch of new business models where you could virtualize uh, or share the radio network if you wanted to or, or other bits of the fixed, fixed network. So you might find new companies, wholesalers, come into the market. So I've been talking to a company that's building a railway line. Uh, and they want to know whether they can put uh, high-performance 5G connectivity down the track, partly for their own use, but also to wholesale it to the normal carriers as well, mm. um, yeah, and and that's that that couldn't be done in in hardware alone. It's, it, it requires some of this software um, capability too. So, but there's some really interesting stuff that's going on. Well, <clears throat> let me ask you this before, because there's so many places we could go with that, and we we still haven't dove hardcore into some of the big myths or big challenges to be solved um, that you talked about at PTC. But as you were just now talking, one of the things in the data center business that we are thinking through all ourselves, my organization, all of our competitors is supply chain. Mm-hmm. You know, we love, um, we have great partners in Asia and other places um, and here in the States that have always been very good for us. But one of the things that the pandemic has revealed is the further away and the um, and and the more bits and pieces of your supply chain, the greater the risk. And it has been an area of focus for us for a while, just because of the nature of our industry. Um, you know, if you're a if you provide for the Department of Defense or for a 911 emergency service, you know, a hundred percent up isn't just like 100% up for your local electrician's database or whatever, no disrespect to electrician's database, but it, it's, it's, you know, it's a life and death situation. So we've always had to really focus in on supply chain and inventory supply, et cetera. You know, as, as we go into the, the democratization and more and more people are joining that, but it's still off the shelf components, aren't they getting those components from the same uh, providers, whatever they are globally? Oh, I mean, absolutely. And, and there's, there's certain bottlenecks in global technology supply chain. Um, a, a really interesting one, it's not my main area, but it's fascinating, is um, the companies that actually make machines that make chips. Right. So ASML in the Netherlands, and uh, there's a couple of uh, US ones as well. And that's a really constrained part of the supply chain at the moment. Mm. Um, but also, you know, uh, semiconductor manufacturer or production in Taiwan is another. Um, but there's there's some, you know, and here it's interesting because, you know, we want to have the benefit of a global sized marketplace and global innovation. Sure. But you also have the physical logistics problems at the moment. And it's not just from the pandemic. It could be from uh, you know, various points in the past. It could be terrorism. It could be oil prices. It right. could be forms of political instability. You obviously got trade as an issue. Um, so I, I think that um, the phrase I heard recently was about 
logistics um, and supply chain management moving from a philosophy of just in time to just in case. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and, and so you have to think through the scenarios of am I got have I got dependencies? Where where what's my alternative? Either source of supply, or do I stock in inventory, or can I buy the same thing wholesale or on an aftermarket somewhere? Or do I have a substitute product? So I think you're going to see. Um, and there's a, I'll, I'll put my self-interest hat here as well. There's, there's going to be a lot more sort of scenario planning going on and people sort of asking what-if type questions. Um, right. and, and sort of, uh, you know, as well as an analyst, I'm a futurist. So that sort of is something that I'm, I, I'm, I'm being conscious of for a while. But I think that the pandemic has suddenly made people realize the value of, of sort of what-if questions. Yeah, and probably as we were saying earlier, um, you know, engineering loves ex, uh, elegance, and so you would have whether it's from an antenna to an air handler mm. or whatever, mm. and software because as you said before in our last conversation, the real world's patchy; it's inconsistent, right? Yeah. And and uh, go well, ahead. Uh, yeah, uh, and and it is inelegant, and and this right. is something that I often see that the cellular industry. Yeah, and it's like a number of other areas, I mean, there's a, a, a really good focus on standardization, on precision, on testing, on interoperability. But that, that's fine until something doesn't work and or it takes too long and there's this trade-off between i mean there's a, there's a lot there's a phrase the perfect is the enemy of the good yes uh, and uh, and 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 you know the truth is that i'm saying is that software it, it does it allows you to hide a lot of com complexity yeah you know, people don't like abstraction layers and yet we use them all the time mm -hmm. and yes abstraction layers um, mask inherent inefficiencies. Um, they're sort of wasteful of, of resources, whether that's memory or power or anything else. But frankly, we're all computing on a day by base, day basis. On your your laptop or your phone has multiple abstraction layers because we can't all program at low levels. So we we take that trade off of convenience versus theoretical inefficiency because it actually makes it usable. Right. And I think that that we'll see that. More and more around networks um, at different levels. You see it, for example, with SD WAN, where you you have a software defined layer with a whole bunch of different connectivity mechanisms under the hood. It's not pretty, mm -hmm. but it's functional and it can save money and it may also give you extra resilience and and um, allow for additional capabilities around security and uh, whatever else you want to do. And so I think that we need to get more comfortable with that sort of heterogeneity and messiness. Um, speaking of messiness, <clears throat> we started off this conversation and the conversation that I heard before, some of the challenges that are in front of us. For example, when you said there were two things that really caught my ear before, which was this uh, around 5G. We'll just start there. Um, doesn't work great in doors or, or, or there's a, there's a, there's a, um, there's an area for us to overcome. And two, yeah. I, as a, as a data center person, but not a telecom person, I just figured 5g was going to work like Wi-Fi, And that was one of the very first things you pointed out was, you know, there's so many people who run around in the general public. I'm not saying telecom experts, no, no. but in the general public, just think I'm just going to turn on my, my 5g thing on my device, whatever that is, and I'm going to have all of these amazing benefits. And you're pointing out, well, wait a minute, what network are you on? And how do these networks come together? And why don't yeah. you clarify that a little bit? Right. Okay. So the first thing is, if, from a wireless point of view, there's a general rule is the higher the frequency, <clears throat> the more capacity you have, mm -hmm. but the shorter the range. Okay. Um, yeah. For a given power. And the other thing is that the higher the frequency, the more it gets um, blocked or attenuated by certain objects, particularly physical objects like walls, uh, yeah, or in some cases, even foliage and rain and snow. Right. Um, and so the paradox with 5G is that the most high performance part of the wireless network, um, the millimeter wave bands that people talk about a lot, don't go through walls. Um, and they struggle with windows as well, um, mm -hmm. unless it's like a 90 degree angle. Mm -hmm. um, 
so what that means is that the 5G you will get indoors, either you will need a dedicated in-building system or it will only be the mid-band or the lower band. Um, probably if it's mid-band, it still has to be a fairly close tower, mm-hmm. um, which means that the cooler 5G features and functions won't work unless you have a dedicated indoor system of some sort. Um, because you know, if you want to have all the all this sort of ultra high bandwidth, ultra low latency stuff, you need quite a lot of of, of frequency spectrum to to play with in order to reserve bandwidth to give yourself that overhead. Um, so that's one thing, and I'll come back to how you would deal with indoor in a moment. The other thing that people don't talk about is that five G will come is coming in stages. It's not like you switch on 5G and everything works magically. You've got this mythical one milliseconds on day one. Mm -hmm. There are three or four phases over the next five, seven years to Mm -hmm. 5G. Phase one is what we have today. And phase one, frankly, is 4G++. It's faster. It's aimed just really at smartphones and also fixed wireless for sort of, you know, residential broadband access. Mm -hmm. Phase two, they only just signed off on the standards a couple of weeks ago, so July uh, 2020. Uh, it's called um, the, the standards body is 3GPP and it's called Release 16. And so, Release 16 is sort of day zero for the cool stuff mm. 5G. That's phase two. And then it, later on, there's, there's Release 17, which probably will um, be ratified at the end of 2021 or early 2022. And you can normally add another year or so in for commercialization and another year beyond that for mass commercialization in networks. Mm. So the the fancy stuff that that 5G is promising, even if everything works, only really starts kicking in 2022, 2023, 2024. Um, And people assume it's all going to be there on on day one. And that's not right. Um, and I think that that is a is a big issue. Is that this, this is a is a it's a long it's going to take a while. So I saw something the other day saying, um, "Oh, Volkswagen has just announced its new um, uh, car manufacturing plant technology strategy." And someone was saying, "Well, why haven't they used 5G?" And I said, "Well." It's because they've got 5G in their testing labs in early stages. And for a car, car company, you know, there's probably a five-year uh, technology cycle from having something in the lab, playing with it, to actually deploying it in a billion-dollar factory um, because of the planning cycle. Right. So, you know, so, so that pathway is important. So for, and then for indoor, you know, if you want to have good indoor 5G, you will need to have some sort of in-building system. And there's a bunch of companies that are doing clever stuff where you might have a repeater you stick on the window or you have you know, new forms of in-building system. All that's great. But if you've got a, hotel, a mid-sized hotel, you don't know how to install that. There's probably only a few hundred, few thousand people on the planet who know how to install that, even if it was available at a good price today. Mm -hmm. Um, Whereas there's probably 300,000 people with some serious Wi-Fi certification and another 3 million who can put up a half-decent Wi-Fi network after they watch a YouTube video or two and read a few manuals. So there's probably a few zeros that need to be get, get added to people who could do a proper indoor millimeter way 5G deployment. At the moment, you could fit them all in a conference center, even with social distancing. Yeah. Yes. So, yeah. But, but is this problem unique to 5G? I mean, did we not face this problem with previous generations of wireless technology? Not as much. Okay. Um, and it's partly because of these frequent, the frequency levels. Mm. Yeah, in the past, certainly with 2G and 3G, you could pretty much say, you know what, I'm going to put a cell tire up and I'm going to, you know, in the right place, and I can pretty much blast through the wall. Right. Um, yeah, and yeah, it, it, the, the signal will drop off a bit, and we all know that there's, the, you, know, you stand in the elevator or in the stairwell, right. you haven't got signal. But actually, most of the time, you can sit on your sofa at home and have a decent experience. You probably might use Wi-Fi anyway, mm-hmm. but I mean, in my house, I know if I, if I go to my bedroom at the top, sometimes I'll switch the Wi-Fi off and just use 4G because it's better. Right. Um, 5G... I might get a, an indicator on my phone which says 5G is available, but it's going to be, frankly, not much better than 4G in a lot of cases. Mm. Um, yeah, you know, probably for, for, you know, there will be an uplift, 
And it depends a bit on the particular operator you've got and how close you are to the cell tower and how many people in your, in your neighborhood in the same cell. Um, but I'm not going to be doing my millisecond latency augmented reality headset or my, you know, automotive robot. And I'm certainly not doing it with my self-driving car in an underground car park. Right. Yeah. Or, 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 that's, that's a good example. So all this self-driving cars need 5G. Well, what happens when it's in the, in the underground car park when there's no signal? It's going to have to park itself. And when I get, you know, when you come out the next day saying, come and meet me at the front door, it, it's going to need a way of actually receiving your signal. So either it's going to have to work on low frequencies as well, or you're going to need to put wireless coverage in your garage, or... Um, it'll have to work on onboard intelligence in some way using visual recognition, machine vision on the you know, how not to, to hit the wall. Um, and, and, and I'll tell you something, I, I haven't met anyone, even at a 5G conference, I'll ask them and say, right, who here wants to get in a vehicle that has cloud braking? <laughs> <laughs> you evidently haven't trained very many teenagers how to drive uh, a vehicle. I don't know that it's, uh, I, I've got a 21, 19 and 17 year old uh, daughters and uh, I've been through this experience with all three of them. And there may be times I might take cloud breaking. I think I've, I think I've been through that experience. Well, <clears throat> so why, you know, is it just, is it just so much then marketing, um, conversation about, I mean, let's actually, before I say that, let me back up. Um, whether it's autonomous vehicles or, you know, a lot of, a lot of the where's a lot of places where 5g catches my imagination is in the healthcare medical arenas, um, where it is a hospital or, or, or something like that, or a remote location where I can, um, I can, you know, I'm running in, um, through dedicated, you know, back end long haul connectivity or whatever, but I've got 5G available to me. And those seem to be, you know, private enterprises, some uh, public enterprises, but where they're really going to um, be able to affect. Um, and that seems like it, that's the beginning of, would you agree or? Yeah, and, and I, I would. And I think, yeah, I, I, mean, I'm, I, come here, I know I'm a, I'm a skeptic on this, but I'm not one of the naysayers. I think 5G right. is important, but I just think it's overhyped. So things like medical, um, an obvious use case is going to be, let's send a, whether it's a, a, an ambulance or a drone, to the scene of an accident with high definition video mm -hmm. so that they can do on the scene triage or right. conferencing a specialist in a trauma specialist who's in the hospital or something like that yeah absolutely high definition of um, the, the killer app in, in, in a way for i think for 5g is outdoor high definition video whether that's mm. security cameras it could be a i don't know a, ro a robot in a smart city disinfecting the streets wh whatever right. and some of that you can do with 4g um yeah depending how good the network is 5g will give more capacity and 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 you know, have certain other capabilities in terms of latency. So you could have a, I don't know, um, you might have a remote-driven snowplow. Mm. It could be something, for example, where you could have someone in a nice, comfortable office driving the snowplow rather than having to get to the depot, you know, 50 miles in the middle of nowhere. Right. Uh, and and but you'd want to have them them with an AR headset. You want to bring back the um, the the video feeds around the vehicle, and the control th the contr the controls would have to be low latency. Right. So that type of scenario, uh, medical, or it, it could also be fixed wireless access to a clinic up in the mountains or something like that, where there's mm -hmm. you can't put fiber to it. Mm -hmm. um, that that would be another good use case. Um, on the other hand, do I think you're going to have um, a 5G connected robot inside the operating theater, three walls away from the outside of the building, in a room which essentially is lead lined and is a Faraday cage. Mm -hmm. But you Hard might have, you could put a small cell there. Mm -hmm. And the, there is a small argument which says in medical environments, there is a big use case for frankly any wireless, whether it's 5G or Wi Fi, which is you don't have to disinfect the wires. Right. Yeah, which is it is not one of the original use cases, but actually, when you've got things like um, uh, uh, 
the uh, re- resistant superbugs, you know, MRSA and a few others, mm-hmm. the fewer surfaces and fewer things that you need to disinfect between each operation or between each patient, the better. So there is an argument to use some sort of wireless connectivity. But it's very specific. It is not mm. this broad brush. Yeah. We're, we're just going to sprinkle 5G dust. And, no. it, right. and this is the thing. is For each individual application, there will be an analysis of how do I solve the problem I have. So if I have a production line in a car factory and I've got certain systems that are bolted to the ground, they don't move, I'll run fiber to them. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, the little robots that are taking bits of bits of material from building A to building B, that's different. You know, the, the, they need the mobility. Um, they obviously can't be connected with fiber. Wi-Fi, I'm worried about interference in unlicensed spectrum. So yeah, that would make sense. But it's it's yeah, I think that the challenge is that for the telecoms industry, they're used to going out and selling a million, ten million, a hundred million SIM cards mm-hmm. to people with smartphones. And yes, it might vary a bit in speed or um does it come with you know video bundle in the bundle? But the fact is that you've got one product, which is mobile broadband, and you're selling it by the million. Whereas this is gonna be a yeah, the, the 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 robot in the factory is very different to, I don't know, um, a, a cart for um, uh, a machine in a hospital, and it's very different again to a um, video display panel in a in a supermarket or to um, I don't know, you could be a drone or the other thousand possible applications, right. and each of those, someone's going to have to go through the decision. Like, right, well. Where's it going to go? Is it going to be in coverage? Do I really need the speed? Can I afford this? Or is there a cheaper way of doing it? Um, Increasingly, you'll also have an intersection point with um, AI, which is how much processing can I do on the device itself Mm -hmm. versus going to the cloud every time? And that is a really interesting trade-off because you know, you, you, we talk about edge compute and, and a lot of people in the, the telecoms and 5G industry say, oh, yeah, we'll put a local data center. I don't buy this at the cell tower, but it could be at an aggregation site for a region. Right. But then you go and talk to some of the chipset companies. They're like, well, yeah, it's frankly, we want to have you know, artificial intelligence baked into the chip with yeah, you know, that goes into the um, the camera. Right. Yeah. So I, I, talk, I mean, a good, a good example. I know facial recognition is a controversial topic, but I, I talked to a camera company, um, uh, like a security camera uh, company, recently, and they said we can download ten thousand persons of interest uh, faces or yeah, or, or overall um, uh, um, head or something like that mm-hmm. to the camera, and it can work offline. To, to flag and uh, yeah, uh, you know, so you might use it for people barred from going to a particular bar or something like that. Or, or buying a weapon, right? Somebody weapon. with a mental health issue in the States. Um, yeah. There's a lot of conversation around um, weapons. And this isn't picking a side. I don't think anybody mm-hmm. around the conversation is saying people with no mental health yeah. issues should be able to go in and buy a weapon, wh- who, whoever else may or may not. And if I have the ability to use technology that help me quickly identify this is hmm. a person who's safe or somebody who has been identified as unsafe, that might be a way to... Yeah. Uh, but, but then you've got this almost like a, a like a, 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 sub, a technology battle mm-hmm. between the, we need a very fast connection to a nearby data center versus mm-hmm. the other folks saying, no, 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 we can do it on the device itself. Why do you need that? Mm-hmm. And, and, and I think that, 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 that then doesn't come down to this, frankly, in my view, um, fake fight between 5G and Wi-Fi or, whatever, or 5G and fiber or anything like that. It comes down to silicon versus data center. Right. Um, which, w- w- yeah, sorry to say that, but you, well, you're going to have, no. but yeah, and so, and so what you may well find is that, that, that for certain applications, people will put the intelligence here. Well, the difference being actually uh, may come down to not even the data speed, but the fact is that if it's a camera on a wall, you're probably in range of power. Whereas right. if it's a wireless device, it's battery powered. You're like, nah, do I run want to run a heavyweight algorithm on something which is going to run out of battery you know, and I need to go and replace the battery? Probably not. I think it's though even as simple as 
because I'm not a futurist like you. Um, if I were, I would have probably made a lot different, better decisions. But um, if I'm in a vehicle that's making decisions, I don't want it to go to the data center to make decisions yes. or the cloud or which the cloud is just somebody else's computer and somebody else's data center, right? I have lots yeah. of clouds at my data centers. I, I wanted to make a decision real time right now. If it's a transactional decision where I'm walking into the mall and they recognize me and based upon my previous buying patterns, they say, hey, Mr. McCall, oh, yeah. we have this on sale over here at this store at this rate or whatever. And I've, as long as I have control over how much data they, you know, how my devices inter interact exactly. with that, right? Which is, yeah. we haven't talked about security yet, but so long as I have the things are interacting with me in the way that I want them to interact with me and it can identify that, then I, I don't want the expense of having to do it hmm. locally. Go to the no, cloud where it's cheaper. Yeah. Because I, now we're just talking milliseconds, but milliseconds in a vehicle is life and death. In, well, exactly. Well, yeah. I, I, this is the thing that, that, that I think that both for power and for time, people fail to think through the orders of magnitude involved. Right. And so... You know, for, for latency, there's certain things like applying the brakes in an emergency where, frankly, I want it in microseconds, not milliseconds. Right. right. Um, certainly at speed. And, and, and in particularly in an in a industrial environment where you've got, I don't know, wheels spinning 1,000 right. revs a minute or whatever it is a, a second. You know, if, if it's out by a microsecond every cycle, that's a problem. Right. Um, yeah. Whereas, and so you've got this huge expand from like microsecond you know, through milliseconds, seconds, you know, minutes, hours, days, right. whatever you want to do. Um, and for certain things, yeah, you know, like a transaction, if you're paying with a card, you know, if it takes one second or two seconds to go okay, nah, doesn't right. really matter. So it can go halfway around the planet for that. Right. Whereas the something else, it's it's you want it in a microsecond. And I think that people don't think that realize that this five, ten orders of magnitude um, for a given application or, or, or possible. And they focus particularly the telecoms industry. Everyone gets really, really exercised with this narrow one millisecond to 10 millisecond or 10 to 100 mm -hmm. bucket. Whereas in fact, the, the buckets either side of that are just as important. And I'm not sure that all the value resides just in the, is it one millisecond or three millisecond or is it 10 millisecond or 30 millisecond? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I th well, you know, I, in an informal poll, meaning a bunch of teenage kids um, or not so teenagers, a number of years ago, I don't know if you've heard of this show over there, but here we have this show called Stranger Things, super popular with I've my no, kids. I've, not, I've heard of it. I haven't seen it. Are you being sarcastic? No, no. I'm and I'm going to, then we're just going to pause here while I pray for you real quick. So Stranger Things, <laughs> especially, <clears throat> it appeals to both young and old. It's set in the early mid 80s, which is uh, 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 aging myself about the time uh, I was getting ready to go off to uh, the army. But it's but it's set in the early 80s in America, kind of middle America. So it's got, you know, the early version of D&D &D and the kid and all the nostalgia, the Trans Am and all of that stuff. And so people in the mid, mid to late 50 year old range, we remember those, you know, pre MTV days with fondness. My kids love it because it's a it's a story um, while set in the past, a very sort of sci-fi cool story. Anyway, where it's relevant to this conversation is if you're at the soccer field or you guys mess it up over there in England, the football field, and you're wanting to watch Stranger Things on your device, in my little informal poll, my crew would rather it be delayed a few seconds and then stream at a really high quality. In other words, it caches, mm -hmm. it loads up, and then um, and the algorithms work and get you know eight ten seconds, and then I want to watch it in high quality as opposed to it's instantly on, meaning it's nearby, but it runs at less than four eighty p or something like that. They would much rather be in that circumstance. They would much rather have. A higher quality, it takes a little bit longer to buffer or whatever because it's going further away to get the data and come than being near, but it's instant on. And that, so they that, have the, yeah. That also, that would make the music to the ears of someone I was talking to recently who's, who does um, satellite delivered broadband for in flight yeah. entertainment. And, and they've obviously got a lot of latency potentially. So, uh. <clears throat> you know, but that's it. Once it gets going, I want it to run at high quality. But if it takes, you know, what, another another this isn't a great example but it's not dissimilar we have um 
streaming services in the house. In fact, I was uh, nonplussed to find out how many we actually have uh, that I'm subscribing to. I don't know why I cut the cable when I've got my cable feed in like eight or 10 services. But some of the services have ads in them. And my, my family's used to watching our shows without ads. And so when they have this interruption for the ad for a minute or two, which you cannot fast forward through, you cannot skip. If you leave the channel and come back, the ad's still playing. You got to wait for the ad to go. That I was trying to explain to them not long ago that it's kind of like, um, you know, if you've got a low quality connection that buffers a lot where you'd have this interruption every few moments. They, they, they would much rather wait, get it all loaded up, and then play it for me than I have these infrequent uh, interruptions. So, I, you know, in the data center business, we are constantly uh, around the conversation of um, there are some things that need to be instantaneous. You're not going to do machine learning from things that are instantaneous. But what you're going to do machining, machine learning from, in our experience, where the crunching is going to happen is it's it going to correl- collect all the data from that car throughout the day. It's going to download it, maybe, maybe stream it. Uh, but at some point, it's going to get it to a data center where it's going to evaluate the braking and the maintenance and the near collision and all of that. It's not going to compute that in real time, it's going to yeah. make sure the car gets to its destination safely or whatever the vehicle is. But at some point, it's going to gather that data someplace and in that data center or whatever. And I don't need 5G for that. I need to get it necessarily. Um, I need back. Uh, uh, yeah, exactly. And, and I think that that's a really important point because yeah, everyone sort of seems to have this view that 5G is going to be the future of AI and re- it's nonsense. I mean, AR, if 5G need, needs AI much more than AI needs 5G. Right. The vast bulk of big data is going to come from homes, from batch load uh, upload of data from a car overnight. It's going to come from uh, machines in a factory, but it will come out of the um, the production um, uh, control system. Yeah, it, it's not going to be sort of a one to one wireless connection with everything. Lots of things aren't wireless. Um, and so there's this sort of mythology that's built up around sort of you know, industrial transformation is dependent on 5G. And there's going to be trillions of dollars of GDP growth associated with it. And I, I look at that and I'm like, firstly, most of this stuff can, you know, 5G, a lot of this stuff can be done with 4G or Wi Fi or um, you know, anything else, or a whole bunch of other wireless technologies. Secondly, the vast majority of data isn't going to touch a wireless network at all. It's going to be data center to data center in particular. Mm-hmm. If you think about um, you know, the way in which online advertising works, most of the data that's going around is between um, you know, the well, your browser to you know, Google or Amazon or wherever else mm-hmm. or a website and then their links date between data centers between their various sort of bits of content on the page and the um, advertising brokers and the information repositories elsewhere and the analytics engines and all that's data centers to data center it's not going via wireless um, and so you know I see these numbers and I think well yeah to be honest AI in all its various guises it's going to be much of a big, bigger deal for society, for mm-hmm. business, for you know, our personal impact on our um, personal um, welfare in future, whether it's healthcare or just what does it mean to be human in, in an AI? I'm not going to go through all the sort of sci fi right. views right. on AI, but one, one way or another, it's going to be important. I, I don't buy this, everyone's going to lose their job, but at the same time, there's going to be a lot of cool stuff that, that it does. And so you've got to believe that. AI in the entirety is going to have a 10x bigger impact on society and the economy than 5G is. Mm-hmm. And you could probably say that biotech will do the same and maybe solar power and maybe quantum computing when it happens and all of these other things, which frankly, in my view, are bigger deals than 5G is. So unless you think you know, AI and quantum computing are ten trillion dollar or hundred trillion dollar things. Then I don't see where this five um, G is a trillion dollars comes from because it just seems that they've got an extra zero or something in there. And I know there's some people who've come up with some reasonably good estimates, but um, well, one of the complications with <clears throat> any of these infrastructures, you said um, 
you said something, I, I don't know if it was your original thought. It was this idea, three sets of laws. You heard it recently and you threw it out there. Do you remember that conversation where it was um, a law of the land, law of economics yeah. and law of physics? What do, what do yes. you mean by that? Oh, no, I'd heard it from a, uh, someone else. That wasn't mine, okay. unfortunately. Okay. And, and it, it, was, it was referring to, um, you know, technology systems, um, you've got a bunch of uh, constraints. Mm -hmm. And yeah, the, the most obvious one is, is law of physics, right? Speed of light is the speed of light. And mm -hmm. yeah, right, if anything, it, it, it goes, it goes the speed of light is slower in glass than it is in vacuum. Right. Um, but it's, yeah, there's still some hard numbers on that. Which is sort of uh, uh, Elon Musk's big idea with uh, Starlink, I think, and other things. His idea is, you know, yes, it takes a long time, relatively speaking, to get from the ground up to the satellite. But to get from the satellite over New York to Singapore is a fraction of the time than it is for it to run in glass all the way around. So it wouldn't make sense from New York to Chicago. I, I'm paraphrasing. I'm yeah. sure Elon would say it better. But from here to the, the exact opposite side of the globe in space and down is a faster transaction than running in glass all the way around is I think is um, like, yeah and it is and you do see that actually between New York and Chicago there are people who run VHF wireless networks because <laughs> speed speed in air is faster than speed in glass as well okay um, anyway so you've got law of physics and you've got you know whether whether it's speed of light or anything to do with conservation of energy or you name it right? mm -hmm. but it's, there's, a, there's a bunch of immutables law of the land um, say on wireless or on telecoms, you've, you've got rules on what you can do with spectrum, on power limits, on where you can site antennas, you've got planning permission, you've got um, competition law. There's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a bunch of rules of varying levels of, you know, from the technology nuts and bolts up to the, the business and society level. Mm -hmm. And then the, the law of economics is ultimately, you got to make money at all this. And, and so, yeah, some of these things, for example, people talk about the ultra low latency sides of 5G. That sounds great. But realistically, there's, I don't know, 7 billion mobile phone users. Mm -hmm. How many hyper low latency robots and drones are we going to have? 10 million? 100 million? Maybe. Right. So let's say that there's going to be. First order of value, let's say this is going to be a hundredth as many ultra low latency devices as phones. Right. Which means that your average revenue per one of those has to be pretty damn high to make it worth re engineering your whole network for. Right. Yeah. And I can't see anyone spending 5,000 bucks a month to connect their drone. Well, so I, I, I guess, you know, we've, we've spent 45 minutes me questioning you about this yeah. are are, are uh, it's it's you know i think we said in the beginning yes 5g is going to come and then yes it will be yeah. at some point prevalent but is it uh, it's, it's a much harder G. hill i think than we think it is to overcome it's, it's 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 important and there will be cool stuff that comes in in a few years time but is it some is it magic no mm. you know is it, it's it's essentially a continuation and i don't think there's going to be this sudden discontinuous jump that people are, are, are pitching you know it, it will come in over time yes as soon as you get your first 5g phone you'll be oh, you'll be you'll be using speed test and go oh look i've got a gigabit a second if i stand in the right place on the right street corner mm. and then when the rest of the world starts using it it'll be yeah, it'll be good. It'll be 100 meg or 200 meg or whatever the number is. Um, but it's it's a steady progression. And, and this, this is uh, an issue I, I mean, I, I, firstly, I hate the term digital transformation. Um, I hate the, yeah, the, the term digital. Really I don't know annoyed. if I hate it, but it's right up there with disruption and others where you've just heard it so many times that you, your eye almost twitches. M Morse code was digital in 1842. Yes. We have had digital communications longer than we've had electricity right. as a service. Right. right? It's, it's, get, it's 180 years old, digital communications. I mean, right. you know, um, yeah, and we've had digital computers since the 1940s. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah, so, so, so anyway, enough of a rant about the word digital. <laughs> uh, I, I, it's like, it's like, actually, you know, one last thing. Any yeah. company out there that has a chief digital officer yeah. 
it's the equivalent of having a chief electricity officer. Sure. <laughs> Why would you do that? Yeah. Anyway, um, so, so, but transformation, again, there's, yes, for some industries, there's, there's going to be certain things which they weren't doing before they are doing now. But we've had transformation for, since the Industrial Revolution. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's been a steady progression through industrial, through electronics, through computing, through internet. And yes, there's a bit of a notch occasionally when, oh, we've got this internet thing. But computing, it's been around for commercially since the 1950s. Mm-hmm. Um, phone, the phone network has been around over 100 years. So it's not like suddenly we've woken up and there's, oh my God, we've got communications everywhere and network this and digital the other this stuff's not new it's just getting better and 5g is another one of those okay maybe the dial does go up another another notch right goes up to 11 hey Hmm. uh, let me ask you this um you one of the things i've heard you say before is uh Telecom's too important to leave up to the telcos, which cracked me up. What what do you mean by that? That that was um I mean that comes back to this democratization thing. Um and yeah, essentially the telecoms industry is very good at doing certain things, particularly for millions of users. It's very good at emergency calls, it's very good at sort of cookie cutter solutions. But there's an awful lot of communications that doesn't fit into that, whether that's the actual physical networks or whether it's communication services. So we're doing this on Zoom. Mm. And Zoom is a great example of it's you know, the idea of video conferencing has been around for decades. Right. But it, Zoom does it well and it's got the user experience right. Yeah, it's done very well in the last few months because of that. It's simplistic. It's simple enough for the consumers to use as well as businesses. Literally, um, excuse me for yeah. interrupting, but literally, I, I had never used Zoom before. I I knew it on the periphery. My daughter is in the other room. I have a one. My youngest is a high school senior. She didn't know Zoom before the it, the schools got disrupted here. She's doing her schoolwork on Zoom with her classmates. It was the 90s. It was so intuitive, hmm. not, not necessarily feature rich. And I'm, this isn't a plug for Zoom or against no, no. any of the others. I've also used um, Teams with some folks that you know set that up. But what I like about them is uh, it was harder for me as a technology guy back in the day to figure out my BlackBerry that first few days that I got it. This was just click, 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 couple tweaks. A friend told me, oh, you can do this virtual background thing. We're operational. Uh, 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 yeah. And, and, and yeah, that's something which, yeah, it's not a, it's not, it's not a secret. The video conferencing, has, I mean, frankly, even before Zoom, yeah, it was, it's been fine with you know, WebEx, and Teams, and Skype, and a bunch of others. People have, have, have got this mostly right for 10, 20 years now. Right. But the telecoms industry didn't. Um, and, and also the telecoms industry in its current form where you've got a few fixed carriers and a few mobile carriers in each country and maybe a whole, couple of wholesale companies, they're not very good at doing customized solutions for you know, a factory or a port or a hospital. Particularly, you know, it could be the indoor stuff. They've only got a certain number of projects they can do. Um, you, We've got a bunch of other companies which have historically, they've run their own um, local area networks, um, their own Wi-Fi networks. You know, your business is based on companies running their own networks and you've got right. you know, fab, you know, interconnection fabrics and everything inside the data centers. So networking both locally and for wide area, if you're a utility company or a rail company or military or the police force you've been running your own wireless or fixed networks for, for, for decades as well um and what's happening is that communications as part of this sort of ongoing shift to whether it's the internet or mobility is becoming so important that some people think well actually i want to run my own network um whether that's put fiber in the ground between my buildings or across town even or i might want to build my own cellular network and conceivably if you're a certain Mr. Musk, you might want to run your own satellites as well. Right. Um, yeah, and um, and so we've now got the this idea that 
it's not just those licensed telecom operators that run communications networks or provide communications applications and services. And the idea that the that everything has to be a monthly subscription, you know, where you get a bill and you're billed per minute or per gigabyte, that doesn't work. You know, there's different models. Some people want to own stuff. Mm-hmm. So I might, if I'm a utility company, it's like, well, actually, I want to run my own network. Firstly, because I think I can engineer it to higher quality. Mm-hmm. Secondly, because I can tune the specifics so that my circuit breakers work based on my network characteristics, not yours. Right. Um, and also, I don't want to be paying by the gigabyte for this stuff. I want to run it myself. And my, by the way, my cost of capital is lower than yours, so I can go and buy it from uh, a small or a large vendor just as easily. Right. Um, yeah. So, so, and you're you're finding property companies, uh, local municipalities are saying, well, yeah, we'll put fiber in on a, and offer it wholesale, and um, or you've got um, ports and airports. Obviously, they've they've run wireless networks of varying sorts for, for years. Um, you've got high railway agencies, highway agencies, um, internet and data center companies running subsea fiber, another good mm-hmm. example. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so, so yeah, everyone is saying, well, communicate, it's a, it, 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 communications is a fundamental part of my business in the same way in which um, you, you, your data centers, you own your, um, uh, your generators. Mm-hmm. You don't get all your power off the grid. Mm-mm. So, yeah, you know, and anyone can go out and buy a generator. So if you think of a telecoms network more like an electricity network where, you know, there is a grid out there, but there's reasons why you want your own generator. So there's reasons right. why you want your own network. Not only that, but we're constantly going to the marketplace to find out what are other sources of power, mm-hmm. um, what, you know, uh, how do we, um, what do we have to buy everything on the grid? Can we, you know, whether it's green energy or whatever, um, also mm-hmm. in the data center industry, um, I don't know if you know Rich Meller over at uh, Data Center Frontier, really, you know, he's a, a been in the data center industry for 30 years, a very, very um, well-informed uh, individual on trends in our industry. Mm-hmm. And one of the things he's talked about is, um, in certain marketplaces, data centers are looking at bringing power generation onto their own property, which mm-hmm. seemed ridiculous just in the very recent past. And they said, well, wait a minute, but if you're in the West Coast where you have brownouts and you have uh, the utility company failing because of subscription or wires or age or whatever, and again, you have some of the most important data centers on earth that have to be up. Um, you, it may absolutely be in your business interest to build out uh, power generation on your property. And so we're, I guess what I, my point with all of that is just that as people are expanding their mind and mm. why do we have to only do it one way? Why do we only have to do it the traditional way? Let's look at the entire, um, the entire yeah. spectrum of options and choose what makes, makes the most sense for our business model. And it comes back to what we were saying before about supply chains. I mean, I mean, there always has to be a limit. I mean, no one's going to say you need your own copper mine, you know, right. to, 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 yeah, right. to, to to make to make to make the, the wires. But yeah, you, you see, you can go to take it too far. But I, certainly, you see data centers that are being put in various parts of the Arctic or wherever, where there's geothermal, or whether there's sure. um, you know, wind, amp or wind, or maybe in, in other parts of the world where there's solar. Or you, know, you, 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 and in fact. In some cases, they are, um, they are able to sell back electricity into the grid. Right. You know, if you put a wind turbine, install solar panels, or put a, a wind turbine up on your property, you certainly you know, in, in, in the UK, I know, there's what's called a feed-in tariff, where you're essentially selling back. Right. So, so you, you're not just generating your electricity, you become a power generator, a power yeah. company. Yeah, well, you can't do that in data centers. I know you're not suggesting no. that, that are in a... Um, you know, a urban area, but if you're in rural, some yeah. suburban, uh, suburb areas, Microsoft had a really cool experiment a couple of years ago. I'm not sure where they are with it now, but they put a data center in the ocean. Oh, yeah, Very small, yeah. really cool thing. And one of the things that their team was working on um, was having it powered, not just cooled, by the ocean, but having it powered by the tides as tides come in. And, you know, I love yeah. that idea of 
constantly innovating and figuring out, keeping your mind open, well, what, what could we do? How do we take advantage of the natural rhythms of our planet um, to, to power and enable these things? Um, anyway, well, I, I thought it was I mean, cool. At a micro scale, that's also happening in what's called uh, energy harvesting, which is relevant for Internet of Things in particular. Mm. But I, I've heard all sorts of ideas of energy harvesting. I've heard of people trying to put, use uh, paving stones that have uh, piezoelectric uh, generators so that when you step on them, it, it powers a LED light or something like that, uh, or road surfaces. Now, obviously, ultimately the energy has got to come from somewhere. So maybe the surface of the road, there's a bit more friction. So it gets transferred over the tires. So your gas mileage goes down a bit, or if you're walking on it, maybe you need to have a slightly bigger lunch uh, to power, to, to indirectly power right. it. Right. No, it's never free. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's not a challenge in my case. One of the things though, that we're, we've become very sensitive to in particular, my company, I think our industry in general, but um, my company, one of the things that I love, uh, we have a, a, a direct a vice president of sustainability and, and energy buying. His name is Travis and Travis is genius in this area. And I normally don't do infomercials or, or plugs for our company, but I do love this one thing that Travis does. We're looking at not just how we power data centers, but what waste are we generating? How are we managing our water? Are we, so when you're talking about pavers, one of the first things I can hear Travis in my ear, we love the idea of that. But are we generating in the long run? We got to dis- mm. when we got to dispose of that thing. Are we creating e waste? That you know what? What is the whole life cycle of the manufacture, the operation, and the recycling of this particular thing? And I heard somebody say, and I could tell I'm getting older because I 15 years ago I'd have been ah you're, you know I'd have been a, a know it all. But somebody said, you know, our ultimate goal, nirvana, is when you can build a building or something where it's like a tree. It comes up in the environment. It's a natural part of the environment. And when it's time for it to go, it goes reclaimed by the environment. There's, there's not a negative uh, consequence. And I don't mean to be Pollyanna or, or um, willfully ignorant. I r- realize, um, you know, we're not talking about trees, but that big idea of as we evolve and as we innovate... We want to recognize the consequences of reclaiming something in the same way as we, we, we use it, right? I, I, mean, I, I, I agree. And I also think that, that a step to that, there's, there's an article in The Economist a month or so back about um, you know, whether we start building in the implied energy cost into almost like have a, a sort of cascading payments in the same way that some taxes work, where mm. if you buy something, there is a inbuilt carbon price in that good or service. Um, you know, so that we end up with a sort of a parallel um, you know, uh, implied, whether it's carbon or energy budget or some other resource budget, um, built into the fabric of all of our transactions. And that's really interesting. And, you know, I, I, I can sort of imagine that getting there gradually. And uh, that, that, that really triggers something um, because we may see that emerge, um, you know, in not just consumer products, but B2B as well. And, and I think that, uh, um, you yeah, that's probably going to be something to watch out for over the next 10, 10 years or so. Well, I, I'm keeping an eye on the time, so don't think that I'm not. And I know you've got a hard stop here. Um, let, 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 in the next few minutes or 15, 20 minutes, maybe maybe a little bit less than that, but I've got to touch on this topic. I'm really curious. Um, Internet of Things. First of all, that that's such a wide open. I've had a number of people on the podcast that talk about Internet of Things. Um, and you reminded me with the footsteps. It seems like on the one hand, my whole house is being overtaken by <laughs> the internet of everything. Um, the one thing I would be willing to pay really, really, really good money for. I'm not sure exactly what my budget would be like right now with my second kid about to go into college. But if I could get that Roomba they sold me to, to actually have artificial intelligence in it, and, um, uh, you know, work exactly the way I imagine it would working, I would pay a fortune. They can have all the data it generates. I just wanted to do its job. But anyway, not picking on Roomba, but it, it, uh, I find it sometimes just sitting there, I'm convinced talking to the cat, like just stopped talking to the <laughs> cat. Uh, but anyway, um, internet of things, <clears throat> I, I don't know that that's much part of 5g. It certainly is part of uh, wireless 
Yeah. On the one hand, I'm really excited about it. On the other hand, it terrifies me. I'm I'm not a cynical person. I'm a pretty optimistic person, but I do have moments of skepticism. And and uh, I'm talking to you from near Atlanta, Georgia. <clears throat> and there has been a more than one occasion I've read something about uh, Internet of Things devices that are, um, on the one hand, yeah, they're telling you who's coming to your porch. On the other hand, they're also used for surveillance. And there's like... You, you know, it, it's this, um, yeah, it's this tension of, <clears throat> I want convenience, I want efficiency, I want uh, better service, I want safety and security, but I don't want to, I don't, I don't want to increase my risk either to make myself vulnerable by somebody who knows how to manipulate, uh, de- uh, manipulate to get their way into uh, my home environment. And I'm an IT guy. So I think we're, it's not it's certainly not impossible to break in, but we are more secure than probably my neighbors. But what, what's your like? How, what's your reaction? Are you fully embracing all of these devices in in your home? Are you mm. cautious with them? What do, what do you think about when you uh, think about uh, Internet of Things? I'm 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 a, I'm a frankly I'm a bit of a luddite when it comes to some of this. Some of, there's certain <laughs> things that I like. So I do have um, Madam A, um, yeah. uh, who, who I will not be naming, uh, behind me, and I've got a couple yeah. of other ones up, upstairs. But yeah. yeah, I haven't got smart locks. I haven't got smart lights. Um, yeah, I, I mean. It, would I do it? Maybe. I mean, I, I, I live in a, a rented house rather than one that I own. So I'm, I'm right. disincentivized to spend my, my weekends tinkering with stuff. Right. But yeah, I don't have it. My, my, I, I drive a, a, a really interesting and fun, partially reliable old bridge <laughs> sports car, which is not connected in any way and occasionally needs, it does have software, which you, which occasionally has a bug relating to how the window winders work. Oh, that's and so, and it's, Yeah. Uh, and you know, like, yeah, for some things, I, I will absolutely find utility in my Fitbit, for example. Right. Um, but then I also got some. I got a birthday, a Christmas present. I've got a a Bluetooth connected electric toothbrush, <laughs> which which comes with an app on your phone and a mounting bracket that it, you can actually put your phone on next to the mirror, and it will try to analyze use. Um, machine vision to work out how well you're brushing your teeth and you know what i think i used that once right laughed at it so i enough so i could do a screen grab to, right. to um put it on twitter and then i haven't used it since it's right. a good i'm good, I'm good toothbrush but right. i don't i don't need that to be connected um yeah and so I, I've, I've got a not a skepticism i understand some people absolutely go to town on this stuff and it mm-hmm. probably does save electricity or a bunch of other stuff but Frankly, life's too short, and and you. Know, whereas I, I can see, I was writing a, a piece for a client the other day about assisted living for mm. you know, elder care or people with vulnerabilities, and there, there's some really important things where you know you could have um, doesn't have to be as intrusive as a camera, but it could be something like like a, a smartwatch, but that has a fall detector, or it have um, maybe for. Uh, patients in care homes who might have dementia, for example, um, you know, where, you, where there's a door sensor which is with, attached to an intercom. With it's two a.m. Are, are you sure this is a good time to get up, or something like that? Right. Where I can absolutely see that that sort of assistive technology is going to be massively important. If you think what's happening with demographics, aging population, certainly in a lot of the world, there are not going to be enough young people to care for older people. Um, and and certainly, yeah, if we if we are carrying with medical progress, you'll have older people, and it's going to probably be one of the last things we manage to to cure is dementia. Mm. So we are, are going to have to deal with with cognitive decline. In a you know, a graceful way, and in, in, in ways that allow people to to live with you know, comfort and dignity, but what perhaps not always with um, a human presence to help, and that's especially important at the moment with with the pandemic, where mm-hmm. there's this the, the, you know, there's a real risk from carers going from patient to patient as a potential vector of of um, COVID transmission, mm-hmm. um, and so being able to to use um, assistive technology whilst or perhaps having a video interface um, you know I can imagine that's a, that type of environment is hugely important. But then there's all the industrial side of things where yeah you know, a lot of frankly the, the the money in IoT in my view is it's a drone inspecting the oil pipeline 
you know, for, for leaks or something like that. It's, it's, it's stuff which is out of sight. It's very sector specific. It is, we talked earlier about the, the remotely driven snowplow or, or um, you know, a smart, a smart wrench. Uh, I just saw, can... a, uh, and in fact, I'm writing and putting together the framework for an article. I've been fascinated lately with AI, robotics, and agriculture and ranching. Yep. Un believable the progress they're making and they have again i think probably a candidate for 5g if you can get the um get the infrastructure to it because it's out of doors it's uh you know there's a lot of the limitations we were talking about before aren't there they have these you know, they have these machines that go down a pro a row of broccoli for example they have all these high power cameras on them little bitty cheap micro cameras and as they go over the broccoli, they don't have to spray it for pesticide or at least not heavy pesticide because they can examine it for pests. Yep. And when they see them, they have a vacuum that sucks it off. They don't cut it. They don't damage the plant. They don't, if they see a weed, they don't have to know what every, uh, what all the weeds in the world are. They just have to know what a broccoli plant looks like. And if they see something that's not a broccoli plant, it has a little metal attachment that comes down scrapes the ground kills the yeah. weed and just goes down 24 7 down the row goes to the next row back and forth doesn't care what the weather is um and spot sprays for water or pesticide or whatever exponentially more efficient um i've seen them ranching taking these yeah. machines that can go out and herd cattle it's uh, yes uh, you know, uh, what i heard is someone's worked out that mm -hmm. A, um, a hive of bees you can detect when there's a risk of uh, disease or some other stress stressor because the buzzing sound sounds slightly different so again ai happy you know this is what happy bees sound like that's what right. sad bees sound like that's you right. know <laughs> <laughs> i love it and it's true i mean you you know so those are the things and you said earlier um you know who were the only people on earth that could not stand when the telegraph came? The Pony Express riders. But they found different jobs, right? And so yeah. it's not, and I don't mean to be um, unsympathetic or willfully ignorant or, you know, that, that yeah. are things going to get interrupted because of artificial intelligence doing things faster and to a greater degree than a human radiologist. I can look at 10 million brain scans quickly and correlate things. Yes. Whether, you know, we will adjust as we always have as human beings to whatever the other services are that come along with that. I, I, I tend to take that view and I have this debate regularly with others. I mean, there's some people who, who believe oh, AI is going to take all our jobs. Therefore, you, you know, universal basic income is usually the debate I end right. up having. And I'm like, nah, I've I'm convinced that by times. that. Uh, I'm unconvinced by that. Firstly, it'll take a long time. Secondly, we've had coffee robots for the last 40 years and yet we have more baristas than ever right yeah yeah just because you can automate something doesn't mean we will automate it i'm not sure i want to have a hair cutting robot right it says not yet. In my ears. You, you know we've, maybe, we've maybe. said I, yeah, true. Uh, we've said things like this forever i i I, mm -hmm. you know, once upon a time, I mean, way back when we said, look, I would never, I will ride my horse or I'll ride my cart or I'll ride my donkey. Why would I ever trust? What happens if the engine fit? We've, we've managed our way around it, right? The wheel makers, the horseshoers, which are still here, morphed mm -hmm. into mechanics and designers and all of these other things. Well, I tend to be, uh, for me, it, that's less of the concern. Uh, although, although, although there's also a bunch of other things which which didn't happen. So we remember yeah, the things which did, but not exactly. Much. We're gonna go uh, ahead. actually one one thing I will say yeah. though, um, and and um, well, I'm conscious of time as well. But sure. um, it, there's a lot of people say, who are saying, "Oh well, you know, computers will replace every um, job we can do, um, and the cognitive capabilities will rival that of the human brain." The question is, what's the energy efficiency yeah I, mean, I, I saw something which said that even with optimistic projections you might need two megawatts or more to replicate human cognitive ability until you know you've got much more than moore's law because of the the efficiencies of, of the chemistry of the brain mm -hmm. and at that point you think well you're not going to replace seven billion people with two megawatts each 
Um, yeah, yeah, so yeah, un- unless you've got a spare few hundred nuclear power right. stations I haven't, I haven't seen before. Right. So yeah, you, you get some of these sort of more sci-fi type projections run in. comes back to what we were saying about law of physics before, is, is you end up with... To have to think about energy, you have to think about. I know you remember about ten years ago. There's this whole thing about nano machines, mm. nanobots, and the rest mm-hmm. of it. You, you run into problems with friction and friction and surface tension and all that stuff of you know, how you and, uh, and you know, um, electrostatic attack, attraction and things, and and how you 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 deal with that in mean, the world. It would end up looking like Velcro for all the nano machines. Um, so yeah, th- there's visions and i think the part of what i try and do is try and work out well what's realistic what's unrealistic what are the things that people are overestimating or underestimating what are the the gotchas and it doesn't mean that things will never happen but sometimes you find an obstacle such as yep that sounds great but you need another three orders of magnitudes of energy efficiency to get there how you can do it right yeah and 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 i think that that it's trying to find those big obstacles that then divert history onto a slightly different path. And I think that at the moment with with sort of AI and some of the IoT, a lot of people are jumping ahead 10, 20, 30 years, or with even things like self-driving vehicles, they're jumping five years ahead and assuming every all the truck drivers are going to be out of work. Right. You know what? What's actually going to reduce the number of truck drivers is not robots, it's retirement. Mm. It's the fact that there aren't enough truck drivers today and there aren't enough young people who want to become truck drivers. So in a, actually, the, the automated, automated uh, trucks, which may well just be on the highway with human drivers in the cities, mm-hmm. that's actually a solution to a problem rather than creating a new problem. Right. Yeah, and it's, it's that un- sequencing of events and it's this, this concept of path dependency of, of the order in which things happen. Well, Dean, thank you for uh, joining me on the episode. I mean, we didn't even, there's so many places we could have gone that we haven't, but uh, we do have, uh, we do have a time stop. I want to honor you getting to take care of your stuff that you need to take care of. If for our next conversation, what are some, what's something that we didn't touch on that might be fun for us to uh, kick around either? um, You know, we talked a lot about today uh, you know, maybe some things that still aren't real that need to be solved around 5G and some other stuff. But what are what what are a couple of the areas that are really interesting to you that you're like, man, I can't wait to see how this develops. Oh, I mean, well, in the in the near term, yeah, sort of edge computing is something we we we, we touched on it a couple of points, mm-hmm. but that's certainly something that's um, relevant. And the other thing is the future shape of the internet. You know, is it going to be regional, national, and that sort of bleeds into some of the, the geopolitics stuff, which we, we sort of danced around, but there's, right. there's clearly a big driver. The other thing which I've been doing a lot of thinking about recently is, is what does everything look like post-COVID? You know, what, what is, you know, what's a smart building? Now, obviously, there's a lot of um, uh, unknowns around the actual epidemiology, but what changes, what changes for the better? What changes for the worse? impact on business on um uh, entertainment on travel um i think that's a, a really interesting one to explore and again i see a lot of people saying oh we'll be in the new normal and i uh, and yeah i go outside and actually the new normal is starting to look ever more like the old normal <laughs> yeah we, we, but but you adjust and right yeah and i, and I think that, that that actually that's interesting because that might change the way we perceive um, the role of government. It might also perceive change the way that all of a sudden innovation and, and workarounds is making making capitalism cooler again. Right. Um, because there's lots of people who are doing all sorts of clever stuff with new um, social apps, and you know, frankly, anyone selling you know plastic screening and you know, designer masks and who knows. So you know, you, you you suddenly get these trends coming out of nowhere, and then from a, a technology point of view. Um, uh, yeah, I, th- I think that, that, that 5G tends to get more focus um, than, 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 say, evolution of Wi-Fi. Mm-hmm. And so there's some cool stuff I'm seeing with Wi-Fi and other unlicensed technologies. Um, and uh, I think that's that's going to carry on. I'm not a cloud expert. There's, there's a bunch of stuff about what next generation of um, compute architectures might, might look like and how that might feed back through to... Um, yeah, the infrastructure we need to support them. 
Um, so there's, there's a lot going on. There's a lot going on, and I appreciate you taking time out of your day to join us uh, here on the QTS Experience. Thank you very much, and I look forward to having you on again. I really, I really appreciate it. Dean Bubbly, everybody. Dean, thanks for joining us. Have a good Thank one. You. Talk to you soon. Thanks, Dave. All right. And if you've enjoyed this conversation, please make sure you like, subscribe, comment, and share it. Uh, thank you again to Dean Bubbly. You can, uh, we'll have in our um, comment section links to Dean's uh, website and all about him. Thank you for joining us. Have a good one, everybody.